Good morning, everybody. It's very loud. Can you guys hear me okay? Because I know I can hear myself here. Uh, welcome to Hively Avenue Mennonite Church, another outdoor service. I know we had planned to do indoor, but this is actually really wonderful outside today. So I hope that you guys are enjoying the breeze and the cool air as it exists right now. Um, again, we're worshiping outdoors because of COVID and the new Delta variant. And so with the new recommendations, uh, with our area being a little bit more of a substantial risk at this point, they're recommending that we be not indoors together. And move this, it's a little bit easier. Um, so if we do go indoors, we do recommend please wear masks regardless of vaccination status. Outdoors, it's a lot less risk if um, you do not wear a mask. So we just ask you to please be respectful of each other. Uh, so far as just welcoming any visitors, if we have anyone new that's visiting today, if, if we would like to introduce those that are here. I see Lee Ray and Winifred have 
family member visiting today. So welcome. Do you want to introduce your... Everybody knows him. <laughs> All right, Jake, I don't know if you want to introduce our visitors that are here. Yeah, I mean, some of you saw them last week. This is my mom, Judy, from Colorado, and our niece, Malia, from Colorado as well. I've been visiting for a couple of weeks. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so far as for announcements today, I wanted to highlight that after the service today, we will have a 50th wedding 50th wedding anniversary celebration for Leroy and Winifred. There will be some cake. We will have it outside here. So congratulations. I feel like we should give you guys a round of applause for that is a huge accomplishment. So congratulations, you guys. Uh, speaking of 50th celebrations, I believe the preschool has a 50th celebration coming up as well. So please check your bulletins for the date for that. There'll be, a, I think, a celebration here. Also, September 12th, we will be having our annual retreat at Friedenswald. Um, so if you are able to come to this, if you or if you're not able to come, if you could please respond one way or the other to Mary so that we can get a head count on how many people will be there for meals, not for meals, what part you're gonna be there. So Dr. Jake, if you're youth and younger, if you're interested in staying the night before, uh, we would like to do that as well. So just keep an eye on your bulletin for some more details about that. Any other announcements that I, missed all right well today we're continuing our series on the wisdom literature and today our passage will be from ecclesiastes and uh, looking at created to live fully uh, we will look into that a little bit more but the the passage of vanity of vanity is all is vanity and just looking at if we think about life here on this earth sometimes it feels frail and it feels fleeting um, and the, 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 the preacher of the, uh, this writing in Ecclesiastes kind of goes on to explore this idea and what does that mean for us? Um, how do we live fully knowing that our lives are fleeting? Um, and the, the main impetus of the service today will be that, yes, our life is frail, our life is fleeting, but we have this God that sustains us, this God that brings eternity into our hearts and that if we, rather than focusing on our life here, if we tie ourselves with that spirit, with that living spirit that moves through us, that we are part of something bigger, we are part of something eternal, um, and that brings us our meaning. So let us have that in our minds today as we worship this God that gives us life, this God um, that is greater than what is around us, that is greater than that which falls to the ground and dies. He is eternal. Um, let's pray. Living God, we thank you that you are beyond us. We thank you that you have power to move the wind and the trees, power to rise the sun and set the sun, power to spin the earth, to create the cosmos, and yet you care about our small, finite lives as well. And you call us to be a part of this beautiful movement that you are doing. We ask that we would remember our frailness, but also remember your greatness today as we worship you and cling to you as the reason that we live and move and breathe. Amen. I invite Chris up at this time. Well, let's sing together. Um, our first song is uh, number 621, My Hope is Built. And as the refrain says, on Christ the solid rock, I stand. So let's stand for this song. The sinking, we can sink back into our chairs after this song. <laughs> Oh, 
right across that page, number 136, Santo, Santo, Holy, Holy. We'll sing the verse in Spanish and then in English. page uh, 57, Holy Spirit, come with power. We'll sing all three verses in English. confession, I encourage of each to reach down and grab a clump of grass. Let's go ahead and pluck up a clump of grass. And I want you to hold this I should do. So I want you to hold this clump of grass and envision that as being your life here in this earth. And we'll confess together from Ecclesiastes that's written in there in your bulletin that's vanity of vanities all is vanity so I want each of you to say that to yourselves at this time and envision that which we strive for that which um, we work so hard and just know that it's so easily just gone so I want each of you to take that clump of grass and just blow it. So while that can feel that life here can be meaningless if it's so easily gone, 
I want us to remember for the words of assurance later on down in Ecclesiastes when the preacher is thinking through this. In verse 3, 14, it says, Whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. So while our lives feel like it may be vanities, it may just be tossed to the wind, whatever God is doing endures forever. So if we cling to that which God is doing, we can join in on that eternal life that he has prepared for us. As we sing this next song together, Spirit of the Living God, may we remember that it is the Spirit of the Living God that gives us life, that moves through us, and that brings meaning to that which we are doing here, and meaning to that which will be done for years to come, whether or not we are a part of that. Chris, I invite you up at this time. this morning. Carolyn um, prepared something for us. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here today. She had to work this morning. So I will be reading um, what Carolyn has prepared for us. Carolyn Marker. And it says this. For the past two weeks, I have been watching my favorite spectacle in sports, the Summer Olympic Games. I admit I am not typically a sports fan. I probably watch more sports during the Summer Olympics than I do for the entire four years leading up to them. I gladly embrace the notion of world unity and peace, and I'm happy to put aside thoughts of conflicts and politics during this time. There is an ancient Greek tradition known as the Olympic Truce, when all conflicts cease during the Olympic Games. Since then, it has served as a principle of the Games. In 1993, the UN passed a resolution calling for all nations to observe the Olympic truce from the seventh day before the opening ceremony to the seventh day following the closing of the Olympic Games. During the Olympic Games, I find myself feeling just a little more patriotic than I normally do, and I usually cheer on USA, but I want every single athlete to perform their very best. There have been some great moments during this year's Olympics in Tokyo. Because of the pandemic, the 2020 Olympics were pushed back to 2021, which was more challenging for some athletes who were prepared last year, while the extra year of training benefited others. We have all been in this together. Some of my favorite moments have been watching Simone Biles, who has been called the greatest gymnast of all times. Though she was expected to bring home so much gold, she chose to withdraw from the most of the competition to make her mental and physical health a priority. Simone has survived the sexual abuse of the former women's gymnastics team doctor and has spoken out about this. What an example she has set for her younger teammates. Some of my other favorite moments are watching the Jamaican women capture all three medals in the 100 meter run and watching American Allison Felix win her 11th Olympic medal at the age of 35 after having survived a life-threatening pregnancy in 2018. I cheered on Hidalin Diaz, the woman who won the Philippines' first gold medal in weightlifting and for China's 14-year-old Quan with her perfect tens in diving. And what a thrill to watch American marathoner Molly Seidel cross the finish line with exuberance, winning the bronze medal in what was just the third marathon she had ever run. Last night during the men's marathon, I watched the runner from the, ne the Netherlands pass his Belgian opponent near the finish line, then turn back and urge him on, giving his opponent the push he needed to win the bronze. After the finish, the three medal winners from Kenya, Netherlands, and Belgium embraced. 
You may have seen many of these moments or heard these stories. But have you heard of the runner Abraham Gulam of South Sudan? He grew up during the South Sudanese Civil War. His family and his country are very poor, often struggling to have one meal a day. And when he started racing, his school loaned him a new pair of running shoes, which he had to return to the school after he graduated so other students could use them. In November of 2019, he and three other athletes from South Sudan were given the opportunity to attend a training camp in Tokyo. After they arrived, the training camp was postponed because of the pandemic, and they weren't able to return home. The Japanese city of Mebashi has become their home away from home for the last year and a half. The athletes took Japanese language classes every morning and trained the rest of the day and were embraced by the local people. The people of Mabashi raised $300,000 to support the South Sudanese team. In April of 2021, Abraham Guam qualified to represent his country's Olympic team, running his best ever time in qualifications. He was given the honor of carrying South Sudan's flag at the opening ceremonies. Guam said, I came from a poor family. Without the support of many people, especially here in Japan, I wouldn't have achieved all of this. I learned how important it is to help each other and be there for each other instead of killing each other. Abraham Guam sees the Olympics as a way he can bring peace to his country and give them hope. This year, again, the Olympic Games has given me a few weeks of faith in the overall good of people and the hope for peace and unity. I invite you to join in me in the peace litany that is written in your bulletins. God of peace, Christ of We now invite the children to come up. Asa and Lara, if you guys want to bring the blanket up when you guys come up. And Jake has a special story prepared for you. sure this thing's not screeching at us the whole time. You guys probably don't want that, do you? Neither do I. Maybe I'll turn it down just. There we go. Okay. Less screechy. Ah, oh, so good to see you guys, especially all crammed together on this little rug here in the middle of the field. I love having you guys here with us. Now I've got a question to start us off this morning. Do you guys, or have you guys, ever done something that just felt pointless, or meaningless? Yeah, ever? What was it, buddy? Anything specific, or you just know you have? Oh, yeah, so you're playing model trains, and every time they hit a bump, they fell off the tracks, and it just felt pointless or meaningless. Yeah, I hear you, buddy. Yeah, I think we've all had those times. In fact, this week, um, one of those times came to me as we were uh, at the beach. We were uh, over at Warren Dunes. You guys have probably been there. And we were walking along, having a good day. Uh, it was towards the end of the day, so we were getting ready to, to go soon. And of course, uh, we were wearing sandals. Asa had on his little like croc shoes. I know everybody has these. But when you're walking in sandy dunes and on a sandy beach with crocs, does it keep the sand out? And no, it doesn't keep the sand out. And of course, Asa was getting frustrated because there was sand inside of his crocs and he wanted to stop and take the sand out of his crocs. But we hadn't gotten out of the sand yet. We hadn't gotten off the beach. And so I was like, Asa, it's not really going to help, buddy, because if you just dump the sand out, it's just going to get back in there in two seconds. It's kind of, what's the word we would use? Pointless, right? To, to try and empty the sand out of your crocs while you're still walking across the sand. And sometimes life can feel that way. Like Everett's train, like Asa's shoes, things can just feel pointless or, or meaningless. Now, this happened to me one time. 
when I was younger too. And the reason I guess I should say I'm bringing this up is that today we're going to be learning a little bit about this book in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures called Ecclesiastes. And one of the things that it says over and over, the writer of it says, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless, which sounds really sad and depressing. And there's actually some happier parts to the book, but there's some truth to it. Sometimes when we look around in life, things can feel really like hard or pointless or meaningless. So my moment when I experienced that was when I was younger, I've, I've shared this with you guys before, but I used to love to play basketball. In fact, this was the ball that I used a lot when I was in high school. It's a little worn out, as you can see, since we've been using it outdoors. But man, our, our church building actually had a gymnasium inside, like a full court gymnasium. So my brother and I and our friends were always in there playing. There's still dents in the wall there from us playing baseball in the gym. Uh, and we were there all the time playing basketball and, and I loved it and uh, I would just play all the time. It kind of was like my life. My, my life revolved around playing basketball. But one summer when we were up at basketball camp, so me and uh, all of our basketball team from school, we were up at camp, at team camp, so we were playing against all these other teams and during one of our games, our coach was kind of quiet. Usually he wasn't quiet. Usually he was yelling his brains out at us. Uh, but he was quiet this game, and he was quiet after we had even lost the game, which we thought was weird. Uh, and he sat us down afterwards, and he told us that a, a friend of ours, Josh Kaner was his name, uh, he had just learned had, had passed away, had been in a car accident, and had passed away. And of course, we were all super sad. We were really surprised about this because we don't think of somebody our age when we're younger um, passing away. We think of them living a long and full life. Um, but this was really sad and it made me think, you know, here I was at basketball camp trying to take this round brown ball and throw it through an orange hoop a bunch of times, more times than the other team. And then, you know, here was a friend of ours whose life ended. And all of a sudden it felt like, gosh, so basketball stuff feels kind of pointless, right? Why am I trying to like spend all my time throwing this ball through a hoop? when life is really short. Uh, and it made me rethink some things. And it made me actually focus a little bit more or think more about maybe what would God have to do? Um, not that basketball was bad, but maybe there's some better things out there that, that God would have me do. Some things that would last longer or be more valuable than, than throwing a ball through a hoop. And that was, that was my like Ecclesiastes moment. The time when I was just thinking, man, meaningless, meaningless, this is all meaningless. Uh, but they realized, but there are things that are more meaningful. And that, that God is the one who actually gives us deeper meaning to some of these things. And, and it's not that I don't ever play basketball anymore. I love playing ball in the backyard with, with Asher and Kiso we've played before. And it's, it's so much fun. And, and God's used that in different ways now. But it's not the thing that my life revolves around. Uh, and that's good, too, because now all of a sudden this, this gift of playing basketball or having fun or playing with our trains, whatever it might be, uh, instead of it being sort of the biggest thing in our life, all of a sudden when our hearts and our eyes focus on God, sometimes those things become a little bit smaller and God becomes a little bit bigger. And, and the things that God is doing eternally or over a long time are the thing that becomes central in our life. And I think this is what the writer of Ecclesiastes kind of gets to, is that we've got to focus our hearts on what God is calling us to do and what God's work is, and then some of this other stuff will fall into place too. It doesn't mean that it's bad, but it just means God is even bigger and better. So that's my hope for you guys. As you get older and you love video games, or you love trains, or you love sports, or you love whatever it is that God has put in your heart to love, that that thing would only be underneath the deeper love that you have for God. And that that would be the first and foremost thing. Because if it doesn't, after a while, it can start to feel a little meaningless. I can tell you that from experience. So let's pray, and then you guys can head back to your seats. It's so good to see you this morning. God, we thank you that you give us a meaning so much deeper than even the joys and the loves that we can have of things in this world like basketball and trains uh, being at the beach, we thank you, God, that you give us a deeper meaning and purpose than all these other things. May our hearts center on that. May they center on you. May they love you before and above all other things. 
And we thank you for all of these precious faces here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Ecclesiastes. Uh, verse 1, 1 through 2, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, and chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, please do so. It says this, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that the people fear before him. Y en español del libro de Eclesiastes, empezando en capítulo 1, versículos 1 a 2, dice... Estas son las palabras del Maestro, Hijo de David, Rey de Jerusalén. Lo más absurdo de lo absurdo, dice el Maestro. Lo más absurdo de lo absurdo. Todo es un absurdo. Y capítulo 3, versículos 9 a 14. ¿Qué provecho saca quien trabaja de tanto afanarse? He visto la tarea que Dios ha impuesto al género humano para abrumarlo con ella. Dios hizo todo hermoso en su momento y puso en la mente humana el sentido del tiempo, aun cuando el hombre no alcanza a comprender la obra de, que Dios realiza de principio a fin. Yo sé que nada hay mejor para el hombre que alegrarse y hacer el bien mientras viva. Y sé también que que es un don de Dios, que el hombre coma o beba y disfrute de todos sus afanes. Sé además que todo lo que Dios ha hecho permanece para siempre, que no hay nada que añadirle ni quitarle, y que Dios lo hizo así para que se le tema. La palabra del Señor, gracias a Dios. I invite Tim Ford at this time. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, we ask you to move through us this morning, give us understanding. May your words rest on Tim's tongue this morning. Amen. I've never preached on the book of Ecclesiastes before. So this was a new experience. And I developed a new appreciation for the book the last couple of weeks. I kind of like this guy, Kehaleth, who is, which means the teacher, the sage, or the quester, um, because he's kind of this interesting combination of cynic and optimist. And I feel like I often have the, both of those things in me, and so it's uh, kind of interesting to see them going back and forth. It was likely not literally Solomon, though that's kind of the uh, what gets alluded to, but someone building on the wisdom tradition of Solomon, which was an accepted literary device, and this book was seen as an integral part of the Hebrew wisdom tradition. And while I've selected two particular passages, uh, to preach on the unique wisdom of Ecclesiastes, you really have to look at the whole a bit. And if you look at the whole, it is easy to think of a prominent cultural allusion to this unique book. And if you're of a certain generation, i.e. my generation, 
you almost automatically begin hearing a tune. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. I won't <clears throat> bless you with the rest of that. <laughs> the whole first part of chapter three of Ecclesiastes became a hit folk rock song performed by the birds in 1965. I was 10. And my parents didn't like rock and roll. They weren't fans of Elvis. They weren't fans of the Beatles. But they let me listen to this one. This one was okay. Pete Seeger had actually written the song in the 1950s. And the, the Birds were the ones who made the cab a pop rock song. And it's been recorded by lots of folks over the years. Seeger and the Birds, Judy Collins, Dolly Parton, uh, a Brazilian Christian rock band called Resgate. So it's gotten lots of play over the years. And while that first part of chapter 3 forms one of the important themes of Ecclesiastes, that there is so much of human experience and activity that we all hold in common, that there's a season to everything and that God is overall, it isn't quite what I would call the central theme. One part of the central theme is the first scripture that was read. And it most often gets translated as it was read. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Or maybe meaning, it's meaningless, is kind of what vanity in this context means, or it's futile. So futility, yes, but there's also a brevity about everything, relatively speaking, and that this vanity of vanities may not be the best translation. Hebel, the Hebrew word, can easily be translated breath. So I like the Anchor Bible commentary that translates it like this. Breath of a breath. The slightest breath, all is breath. Breath vanishes, breath is fleeting. We saw holding the grass, what happens when we blow on it. Another lesser way of translating might be empty or ungraspable with a little sense of mystery to it. Emptiness of emptiness, all is empty. Everything is ungraspable. <laughs> so futility, meaninglessness, a breath, mysteriously empty. That's initially how this teacher, sage, quester sees life. And can life sometimes feel futile and meaningless? You bet your life it can. We've all likely had moments that we've talked about where that seems to be the case. We ask, what difference has my life made or is making? What difference has the existence of a group that I'm part of, like Highway Avenue Mennonite Church? What difference has that made? Are there times that the mystery of life seems beyond our grasp, all the whys and wherefores, the purpose of it? Of course it can. Lately I've been uh, struck with this as I've been participating in a variety of meetings, including the Defund the Police study, where we hear about racism and violence, both neighborhood violence and police violence, particularly against people of color, the injustices of our justice and incarceration systems and homelessness, and it can feel overwhelming and beyond my grasp, like I don't know quite where to grab a hold of it all. And as I look back over my own life, I find I've experienced meaningful work on one hand, but a number of places where I had hoped to accomplish more that might seem longer lasting. If you are my age, can life seem like but a breath? You bet your life it can. All of a sudden, I remember my dad and my uncle both talking about how it seemed life had gone by all too quickly, and I wondered, what in the world are they talking about? No problem identifying with that now. And these are the bookends of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, verse 2, and then at the end, in chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, it says, So human dust will return to the earth where it was before, and the breath of life will return to God who made it. Breath of a breath, says the teacher, all is a breath. Uh, it is a little helpful to recognize that most of this, that this would have been written be before much of any Hebrew thought included belief in an afterlife. It was simply primarily seen as ashes to ashes and dust to dust. So this is a major theme. Life can seem, and to some degree is, futile and empty. And it is certainly a mystery that often seems beyond our grasp 
and it is but a breath in the continuum of time and history. So the other main point of Ecclesiastes then is basically, so what? So if life is often futile, a mystery of emptiness beyond our grasp and but a breath, if those are the bookends, what's in the middle? What is life about? Is anything worthwhile? And at one initial level, it doesn't seem like the conclusion is all that outstanding. It seems to be that this is it. The best we can do is live life as fully as possible, both in the pleasures of life and in the work we do, and believe that God is somehow present and active, even though we never get the whole picture, and rely on relationships and community. And while there are a lot of other pieces of wisdom, this is kind of the central piece, the central theme given several times over the course of the book. The passage from chapter 3 that was read being one of the central ones, yet God has put in their minds an enigma, a mystery. This is after saying that, that God has put eternity in our hearts. So here it's saying God has put a mystery in our hearts. And yet we cannot discover what it is that God is doing from beginning to end. The writer says, I do know that humankind's only satisfaction is to be happy and to find pleasure in living. Indeed, when a human being can eat and drink and find satisfaction in their occupation, they have a gift from God. I know that whatever God does will endure. And this is stated repeatedly in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 24. There is nothing better for a human than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in doing their work. Even this, I see, is in God's hands. And in chapter 5 and verse 18, So I reach the conclusion that what is satisfying and suitable is to eat and drink and enjoy oneself and all one's struggles under the sun during the few years which God grants a human being. That is what one gets out of it. Also in chapter 5, then, it talks about Two are better than one. And so there's this talking about community is important to the process. It's actually where we uh, take our kind of common wisdom saying of two heads are better than one. It's actually that two are better than one in all of life, that it's good to have companions. And then in chapter 9, verse 7, So then, eat your bread with cheerfulness and drink your wine with an untroubled mind, since already God has approved of everything, of everything that you do. Everything your hand finds to do, do it with your whole strength. At the very conclusion in 1213, the writer simply says, The sum of the matter when all has been heard is this, reverence God and observe God's laws. So does God want us to enjoy life? You bet your life. Does God want us to acknowledge its brevity? You bet your life. Does God want us to have meaningful work and to put meaning into our work? You bet your life. Does God want us to acknowledge that God is God and we are not? Thank God, you bet your life. The teacher sage and quester's conclusion, given the options, this is the best bet we have to bet our lives on. To enjoy life, to do good work, to reverence God. It's kind of like what's called Pascal's wager. Blaise Pascal was a philosopher, and his basic argument, one of his basic arguments was a simple one. Reason and intellect cannot decide the question of whether God exists or not. Therefore, it makes sense to choose the option that would benefit us the most should we be right, and that is that God exists. That seems to be in part almost what the writer of Ecclesiastes is doing. Life is brief and can often seem futile, but here's our best bet. I remembered when I was working on this that some years ago I wrote a poem about betting my life on God and on faith and love. And it was kind of based out of this Pascal's wager. I couldn't find it, but I know it did also include the part that we do this because God is love, and that's the best thing we can bet our life on. In Anabaptist perspective, we want to view this wisdom of Ecclesiastes through the lens of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't really dispute anything that the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, but he enhances it and blossoms it with hope and love. Jesus walks through the fullness of human experience. He lives the lyrics of 
uh, there's a time for this and a time for that, and of turn, turn, turn. He lives, he lives the fullness of the human experience. And life may seem futile at moments, and like a breath, but there is also this thing called the reign of God or the kingdom of God that gives a context for our living. Jesus fills it full of meaning. Life is brief, but Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There's a context. All may seem like vanity and like a breath, but there's this bigger picture, this bigger story that you can be a part of even beyond your life of the reign or kingdom of God. And two are better than one. In Jesus, the community even goes well beyond the Hebrew people. Life is a breath, but Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto the disciples. Reverence God, and that God is a God of love. It becomes a much fuller and better bet. Is life all too breath-like and fleeting? You bet your life. Can life feel futile? Of course it can. But should life be fully enjoyed? You bet your life. Is pleasure a gift from God? Of course. Is there an overarching purpose and story? You bet your life there is. And a vision that we are living toward? Is there a beloved community with whom you can travel this journey? You bet your life there is. I often think then of the song, O love that will not let me go. And then a friend of mine, Jim Crokert, wrote a song, What is this love? What is this love that won't let go of me? What is this love that won't let go of us? Can we trust it? You bet your life you can. And if we've, mis if we've misplaced our bet, isn't the world still better off? The way of Jesus, abundant life, the reign of God rooted in a God of love, it is where I want to bet my life. And I hope you do too. I'm going to close with a song with the song called What Is This Love by Jim Krogert. I think I will be able to play it for you. It has two verses. Now, let's see. Got it. It has two verses, and I won't read the whole lyrics, but the first verse, person is in the throes of a large decision and wishes he could see the whole plan. And then the second verse he acknowledges that sometimes a word is spoken at just the right time and air breathes in and fills the room and sometimes that doesn't happen and you just have to trust the mystery and the chorus then is always well what is this love what is this love that will not let me go that has a hold upon my soul that I can't break and at the very last Jim writes and when my body lies beneath the prairie I will not be buried I'll be carried by that love. Oh, and I can't break. 
may it be so.